Good morning, all. Apologies for the late start. The meeting is reconvened, and I'd like to welcome all of you here this morning. This is the 33rd meeting of the Joint Select Committee on Finance and Legal Affairs. This is our first public hearing in to our inquiry into consumer awareness, empowerment, and protection systems. The committee wishes to welcome officials and representatives of the Ministry of Trade and Industry and the Ministry of Health. From left to right, I will invite you all to introduce yourselves to the members of the listening and viewing public. Dr. Rahman. Good morning, Dr. Saeed Rahman. I'm the Director of Veterinary Public Health in the Ministry of Health. Morning, Chair Nitin Fas Khan, Chief Chemist Director of Chemistry Food and Drugs, Ministry of Health. Good morning, Chair and Members. Margaret Morales, Acting Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Health. Good morning, Chairman and Members of the Joint Select Committee. My name is Frances Senori, Acting Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Trade and Industry. Good morning, Chair and Members. My name is Derek Lukpat. I'm the Executive Director at the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards. Good morning, Chair and Members. I'm Dexter Morgan, Director, Consumer Guidance and Protection, Ministry of Trade and Industry, uh, Consumer Affairs Division. Good morning, Chair members. My name is Hasmat Ali. I'm the Registrar of Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals at the Chemistry, Food and Drugs Division, Ministry of Health. Good morning, Chair and members of the team. I am Eugene McCarthy, the Assistant Director of the Chemistry, Food and Drugs Division of the Ministry of Health. Good morning, Chair and members. My name is Claudette Jordan John, and I'm the Acting Senior Consumer Advocate at the Consumer Affairs Division. Good morning, Chair and Members. I'm Feroza Matthew, Senior Research Officer at the Consumer Affairs Division of the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Good morning, Chair and Members. I am Nairon Mohammed, Senior Research Strategist, Ministry of Trade and Industry. Good morning, Chair and Members. My name is Dana Marie Isles. I'm the Director of Legal, uh, Legal Services, Ministry of Trade and Industry. Good morning, I am Cassie Ann James, Manager of Corporate Communications at the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And I can't tell if the gentleman to the back is sitting at a desk or just observing. Thank you. My name is Sophia Choate, and I'm the chairman of this committee. And I will now ask members of the committee to introduce themselves to you, starting from my left. Good morning, all. Tahar Kobika, member. Good morning, all. I'm Vidya Gaidin Gopi Singh, member. Good morning, Clarence Rambarat, vice chairman. Morning, all. Lester Henry, member. Good morning, Terence Tial Singh, member. Now, I know that we all in this room, we are aware of what are the objectives of the inquiry, but for the members of the listening public, listening and viewing public, I'm going to read out the three objectives of the inquiry. One, to assess the adequacy and effectiveness of existing consumer protection legislation and policies to evaluate the performance of consumer protection agencies managed or controlled by the state, and three, to determine the effectiveness of current provisions for consumer protection to vulnerable groups, primarily senior citizens, those of low literacy or education, persons with disabilities, and rural populations. The process of our inquiries um, usually begins with an opening statement from the chief officials representing the various entities which come before us. 
So I will ask Ms. Frances Signore to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good morning once again. The Ministry of Trade and Industry is appreciative of this opportunity to participate in this inquiry into consumer awareness, empowerment, and protection systems. We understand the importance of achieving the objectives set out, which dovetail with the tenets of the National Consumer Policy 2018-2023, which are one, to harmonize and modernize the existing legal and regulatory framework for consumer protection, two, to ensure consumers are sufficiently well informed and empowered, three, to enhance and provide accessible and efficient redress systems for consumer protection issues, and four, to eliminate and discourage unfair business practices. These objectives are further reinforced in the Trinidad and Tobago Trade Policy 2019-2023, which highlights among several action points, engendering confidence among consumers, including those engaged in e-commerce, enhancing private sector compliance with international standards and regulations, and proclamation of the Fair Trading Act. Today's meeting of the JSC is timely, giving the proclamation this week of the Fair Trading Act, which allows the Fair Trading Commission to now officially receive and investigate complaints of anti-competitive conduct. The benefits of an effective commission will likely lead to lower prices, higher quality goods and services, which all will redound to the consumer's benefit. This complements the work of the Consumer Affairs Division of the Ministry of Trade and Industry and the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards. The Ministry of Trade and Industry is cognizant of the significant roles to be played by all the agencies in empowering and protecting consumers. We look forward to the recommendations which will emanate from today's session and they will undoubtedly be valuable as the Ministry of Trade and Industry prepares for World Consumer Rights Day, which is annually commemorated on March 15. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Ms. Morales. Thank you, Chair. Good morning once more. I wish to thank you for granting us the opportunity to appear before this committee to contribute on the discussion on consumer awareness, empowerment, and protection systems. The Ministry of Health recognizes that the government's public health response requires an alignment of policies, practices, and systems across various ministries and agencies which form part of the national food control system to provide adequate protection of the consumer and this increases our ability to trade intra-regionally and internationally. This will enable better choices with respect to food and the protection of all citizens. Toward this end, the Ministry of Health, through the Chemistry, Food and Drugs Division, the Veterinary Public Health Unit, and the Public Health Inspectorate, continues to update regulations, policies, systems and practices to ensure the protection of the population against unsafe foods, adverse practices of food fraud, misuse of toxic chemicals and pesticides, and false product information. These potential risks adversely impact the overall health of the population, and it is critical that all the systems and regulatory controls be fully instituted amongst the various entities. It is also important for us to collaborate with the other agencies, such as the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and the Customs and Excise Division, and to share resources to safeguard the health of the population. The Ministry is therefore committed to the provision of public health functions as part of its obligation to preserving and maintaining the overall health of the population and to working with the other public sector entities in achieving this objective. We look forward to today's session and to getting feedback from the committee as we move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Booth. Now, I just want to make it clear in case, in case um, the officials from the Ministry of Health have any concerns. The, while the minister is a member of this committee, he will not be participating in any part of the inquiry which deals with um, questions pertaining to the functioning of departments under his ministry. Santo Biko. Thanks, Chair. Uh, if I can go straight to the response to the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Um, on page 32, item 20, uh, it has to do with the response to the question about the number of accredited labs in Trinidad and Tobago. And you know, there's, not to give life to any rumors, but there are there are stories about the number of accredited labs that we have in the country. I don't want to place a number on it um, without having proper information. But I saw that there was one lab that, that, be, that, that got accredited last year. I'm not sure exactly what was the area of focus in San Fernando. Uh, um, the question is, notwithstanding the response, labs help us when we are exporting to have confidence. So if the labs, that, besides being accredited locally, are these labs recognized with our major trading partners, export partners? I'll give a simple example. Jamaica exports via Grace Kennedy beverages and so on to new markets in West Africa, for example, and in the Far East, they are looking at. We have companies that export as well. Although SMG produces in South Africa, they may have other companies that export, for example, Sasha Cosmetics to West Africa and other new markets. Are the labs that we have here accredited with our major trading partners? That is one issue. And are we comfortable with the, uh, the ability to test products for new um, entrepreneurs who create new products for the local market? So one is for export and one is the local market. Or, or capacity. We'll take that question. Madam Chair, I'd like to ask Mr. Lepat of the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards to respond. Good morning again. Uh, if I may, accreditation is the third party assessment of competence to conduct a particular conformity assessment test. So you will hear the term use accredited laboratories, and there are various types of laboratories. In this particular case, we can say laboratories to test certain aspects or for specifications of certain products. Accreditation, there are, are recognized accreditation bodies throughout the, the world. Um, and they, at present, the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards is the national accreditation, accrediting body. Um, there is a cabinet approved um, process taking place now to separate due to conflicts of interest where there would be an independent accreditation body locally here in Trinidad and Tobago. So just as a bit of context. In terms of, to, to attempt to answer the question, the lab, the accreditation process is to do with a test. So a lab may do several tests and they may see fit to seek accreditation for a particular test. In the case of the items that you would have mentioned, depending on what the standards for the required by the export, the, the country to which our local manufacturer may be targeting, they may require validation of those conformity to those specifications. The in the, the manufacturer can choose to have those tested at any lab that it has accreditation to that test anywhere in the world. And it is up to them to ensure that the importer recognizes the, that particular test from that particular entity. And there's a system by which that can be done. We have, because now this is a very, I don't want it to seem as if it's an ambush question, right? But even if there is no response today, if we can get it in the future, it will be helpful. Um, 
for example, in the fast-moving consumer goods section. So this specifically has to do with, with our major trading partners. Uh, are we comfortable that, notwithstanding the, the opportunity to go to labs in other territories, are we comfortable that the labs and the, the labs that are accredited in Trinidad and Tobago have uh, the preferred status that is required to enter the markets of our major export partners for fast-moving consumer goods, which is a main part of our manufacturing sector. So in Trinidad and Tobago, there are a number of labs that are credited to specific tests, which includes the Bureau of Standards, Kariri, and a few others as well. There are, it, depending on, uh, it would really depend on the test itself or the requirement to ascertain whether it meets the needs of the, the trading partners. So in FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, uh, if we were to use food or cosmetics, um, I'm not in a position to, to say if it's present. I'm simply aware that there are some, there are some labs in Trinidad and Tobago that are accredited to specific tests. I can speak on behalf of the Bureau of Standards that we have some, and they are to do with conformity assessment for other products, construction goods, um, et cetera. So I'm not in a position to, to speak specifically to what tests would, if they are labs that are credited to those specific tests for FMCG products. But I could find out. I'm grateful for that. And if I ask one last question, it has to do with um, the popular issue of the quality of fuel being tested, Chair, in terms of um, if, if, there, if there's any reporting mechanism where the public can have access to information on an ongoing basis, given that we are importing fuel um, as to the quality of uh, diesel, for example, because you haven't, I want to say rumors because they're not substantiated, that the quality of the, the diesel is, is, is subpar and is affecting vehicle owners and so on. So is there any mechanism by which members of the public can get information as to the quality of the diesel that they are using in their vehicles? TTBS is aware of the complaints. We are, as the, the um, regulator for the compulsory standards for gasoline and diesel, we are actively engaging with the importer as well as the wholesalers on the matter as to access for the information that we are, I believe that it would be through the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries that would have to be able to disseminate that information. We at the Bureau have access to what are called certificates of quality for the imported fuel against our role in ensuring that they meet the existing compulsory national standards for both gasoline and diesel fuel. Mark, are you, are you satisfied that they have met the quality required for diesel in particular, for example, and super and premium? Based on the um, checks that we've done so far, we get the certificates of quality regularly they meet the, ex the, the existing standards that pertain to them. Okay, Mr. Tullock, Pat, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it seems to me as though there is considerable overlap in terms of um, where complaints can be made and where complaints have to be addressed. Is it that if someone has a complaint about the quality of diesel, let's say, which they've purchased at a gas station, um, they come to you? Is it that they come to the um, TTBS to lodge their complaint? Or do they go to the Ministry of Energy? Chair, the consumer, from what I've observed over the last, say, 12 months, they typically go to uh, the Ministry of Energy or they may go directly to the wholesalers. We have had some come to us. What typically has been happening, because we at the TTBS consider it uh, uh, one of our high priority sectors, that of, 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 of fuels, we have been monitoring uh, social media pages regularly and we typically would collaborate um, with the key stakeholders, Ministry of Energy, um, NP, Unipet, et cetera, on those, on those matters to be able to work towards identifying the, the issue in a, in, a, in a comprehensive manner and one, and one that we are coming together to understand the different facets. Sure, but what I'm trying to, to ascertain is this. 
someone listening to this program, for example, who wants to make a complaint or who in the future may think that they want to make a complaint, um, where is the best place for them to go? To you? Given that TTBS is, that fuels fall under um, a compulsory standard, TTBS would certainly be one of the, the, I would say, the key points for which consumers could interface, and we do have a consumer liaison officer who would take the complaints disseminated to the right people for action. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good morning again. I have seen it, the submission from the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and there is really a suite of consumer protection legislation. We have Consumer Protection and Safety Act, we have the Higher Purchase Act, we have Misrepresentation Act, and so. Are these laws really provide a harmonized legal framework for consumers? Um, and more particularly, the Metrology Act. How effective is this act because of my number of years in practice, I have never seen a person walk into court with a scale as an exhibit. Because under the Metrology Act, you would have persons going around checking parlor and supermarket and shops and so to see whether scales have been calibrated. Take for example, if a person says he gets five ounces or less than a pound of cabbage, what does he do? Who sees about whether the weight that has to be given to the consumer is the weight that he receives and is not that he is deceived? So firstly, how effective are these laws? And is it that any, under any of these laws, any person has been brought before the courts for the commission of any offense? Members, thank you for the question. I think it's very pertinent for all the consumers. In terms of the suite of legislation, it's been acknowledged that there is need for a harmonized approach, and that is currently in train based on the new consumer policy for uh, 2018 to 2023. The specifics with respect to metrology, that, as far as we are aware, there does not appear to have been anyone who's been brought before the courts. Um, what is provided for in the, perhaps, perhaps it may fall under the new Fair Trading Act in terms of what is, um, what is possible. And now that the act has been proclaimed and the commission is now able to investigate unfair practices, that is a measure, that is going to be an opportunity to have um, complaints made to the Tr Fair Trading Commission for the investigations to take place and for an approach to be made to the court. Now, this was a, an act that was just proclaimed this week, but that may be one avenue that it can, um, that can be pursued. I, perhaps the TTPS, TTBS can speak to some of the work that they do in terms of the testing, uh, the, uh, the scales, and so on. Good morning again, member. So, Trinidad Tobago Bureau of Standards is um, also the National Me Measurement Institute, and we are governed apart from the Standards Act and Regulations, the Metrology Act and Regulations. We have a division that is called the Legal Metrology Inspectorate, and one of the which 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 uh, one of the key duties is to ensure that the devices used in trade are accurate and that consumers are. Uh, pay in terms of the weight, measurements rather, for get what they pay for. We would have, um, the, the inspector has been working uh, assiduously over the years uh, since the proclamation to ensure that those scales are uh, all, that they're calibrated accurately. And we cover groceries, supermarkets, uh, couriers. We recently embarked on going throughout the entire uh, municipal and NAMDEVCO marketplaces. We are 
I would say approximately uh, two thirds the way through on the first cycle. It's an annual uh, verification process. To my knowledge, I don't. I'm not aware of any um, person or, or organization that's been brought before the court on a matter on, on a related matter. The Legal Metrology Inspectorate. I believe when I read through the document it says that it's located. We have different geographical locations. Honestly, I don't know what is this inspectorate because I need to be guided. Is it, this inspectorate is sufficiently resourced to deal with all these different institutions that they have to go to? And uh, if it is located in specific geographical areas, what criteria are used to determine this inspectorate is in Curep, or one is in Tunapuna, or one is in Pinal. Uh, what criteria are you used? Because from your the readings, I'm seeing they are located at specific geographical locations. Is that so? Uh, remember, no, that's not the case. We are, our primary location is on the ETEC Industrial Estate in uh, Makoya. That is our main base. We do have a south office as well. We have inspectors not in legal metrology at what we call different ports for other types of inspection, but as it relates to legal metrology, no, we, are, we operate out of one base and the activities are done based on scheduling. So they are deliberate um, verification activities that are scheduled with various entities. So they are aware when we are coming, but they are also what we call market surveillance, where those are random and determined by the chief inspector based on information coming out of the results of those verifications as well as any consumer complaints. Chairman has a question. Thank you very much. My colleague, the Minister of Health, has been all over the country talking about non-communicable diseases and the way in which the, 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 the rise and the chronic position we find ourselves in. I am very concerned about some of the things that I see in pharmacies, supermarkets, gyms, and they relate to energy drinks, energy bars, products that will make you slim very quickly, oh, yeah. products that will melt mm -hmm. belly fat in seven days, super greens, omega products, 12 essential oils. Every morning when I turn on the television, I see somebody peddling some omega or some oil product. My question is in relation specifically to the growing interest in weight loss, and fitness in this country, what measures are in place to protect consumers, to protect the public, to inform the public about the risks of these get slim quick and boost your energy products that are proliferating the supermarkets, the pharmacies, the gyms, the parlors, and everywhere else in the country? I would think that's us, um, something for the Ministry of Health. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will have to refer that question to the Director of the Chemistry, Food and Drugs Division. Okay, good, good morning, members. As related to these items, there, with regards to energy drinks, there are international and regional standards that are applicable for energy drinks. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we use those same guidelines regarding energy drinks. As part of the registration process, which is in law, all of those Omega would have to go through a thorough registration process, which is quite robust, that has to go to an evaluation committee known as the Drug Advisory Committee, that has experts from different areas, both in terms of pharmaceutical as well as the, the medical field. They would do the due deliberation in going through certificate of analysis, GMP, CPP, um, look at the medical and the medical claims, also clinical research that has been done and some of these products also goes to the committee for evaluation. Pending that 
evaluation recommendation is then made to the minister for the approval based on the safety and the efficacy of this particular drug in the case of the Omega XL and those suite of, of pharmaceutical products. So that is the regulatory function and the regulatory process that pertains at the Chemistry Food and Drugs Division, Ministry of Health. I have a, uh, an inquiry. Uh, how do you test? Because you, I am looking at um, when we last spoke, this was in 2017, I believe, and we had done a site visit to uh, your division. So at that time, it was contemplated that um, we would have had a national public health lab within five years, but in any event, the building that we had visited and toured with you um, was expected to be ready for testing by the end of 2017. So is it at that building that testing is done? I'll be able to answer part of the question. And the other part, I'll ask um, the deputy director to, give, to elaborate on that particular issue. So when we look internationally, there's the whole concept of reliance and we look at WHO guidelines, and we look at the reliance from regulatory authorities that would have done certain degree of testing in great detail, and based on this particular reliance, and the concept is an international concept that is used worldwide. So when a drug comes into Trinidad for registration, we use the concept of reliance from either PAHO, WHO, or even some of the more developed regions um, within the Americas, um, Europe, and that gives us a certain degree of confidence in terms of the safety and the efficacy of a particular drug. So you use that together with the certificate of analysis that would originate from an accredited lab or could also originate from the manufacturing facilities that have been issued with a, something called a certificate of pharmaceutical product that gives the assurance that this particular product that is entered our market would have gone through a certain degree of testing and would have met the WHO requirements with respect to safety and efficacy of the drug. Mr. Khan, I think that it is important for us when we are engaged in these inquiries uh, to be very clear about what we are saying. And I think someone may have perhaps been mistaken when you made your initial contribution into thinking that there was some sort of evaluation being done here. Um, I might understand it that what you're talking about is reliance on um, certification from accredited systems. If I may add also, we also have the opportunity through the um, Jamaica Drug Testing Lab where we can actually send samples through our ministry to the testing lab situated in Jamaica with this control on a CAFA that will give us also those sort of testing results that is required for and is used in terms of the registration process. Well, you didn't quite um, answer what I asked you, but is it then that there have been instances where um, the committee is asked to say, okay, this product is all right to go on the market? and the committee looks at the accredited tests done in other jurisdictions, and the committee says, okay, well, this looks, this looks good to us, so we can move forward. And there have been other instances when further testing needs to be done, in which case you go to the Jamaican facility. Is that how it works? Yeah, so once, once we receive an accredited test results, based on the international concept of accreditation, there's confidence in those results. In terms of the test method that has been used, the quality management program that has been instituted at the facility, the accreditation gives you that assurance. So the test results is valid and is acceptable international once that particular test method, as well as the lab, has the accreditation under ISO or some other international certification body. Um, so yes, we would use both both opportunities, the regional testing, the testing from foreign markets and accredited labs and manufacturing facilities. We also have the opportunity locally to use, for example, Kareri also has capacity to do some level of drug testing 
and we also has that opportunity to access Curry in conducting some of the analysis that would be required in terms of the registration process. Thank you, thank you. To Consumer Affairs and to Mr. Khan, I'm going back to, to what I asked originally. So based on what you've said, in terms of testing, certifying, accreditation, and so on, somebody going, so for, so somebody going into a pharmacy, for example, Super Farm, you go and you see a display, a very large display. Somebody going in there, going in there and seeing a product advertised as removes belly fat in seven days. The certification accreditation testing process has established that a consumer purchasing that product will have belly fat, all the belly fat removed in seven days. Because that is what they say on the labels, all these labels. You, have, you, you go into GNC, you go into all these, these stores and you see things, you see products, for example, with Moringa. And, and the labels and the advertising makes a lot of claims. The labels, and this deals with Bureau of Standards, it deals with, with consumer affairs, it deals with public health. Consumers looking at those products and making a decision to purchase it, have they, do they have some assurance that these products will do what is, it, it is said they will do? Or are the consumers in our country at risk by being fleeced by importers, retailers, and advertisers of products that will not do what the advertisements and label claim they would do. Who is prepared to go to the wicket? I would have thought Mr. Morgan is best placed. Perhaps we can hear from you, Mr. Morgan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, with respect to, to labels, right, the, the Consumer Affairs Division uh, is not responsible for labels as, as it relates to food and drug items. We look at labels in terms of um, consumer goods, consumer durable goods, really. So if it is you, you, you purchase a, a particular product, let's say, and it's, it's manufactured in um, USA per se, right? Under the, trade, under the Trade Description Act, if it is not uh, manufactured in the USA, we would see that as a, a, what you call a false or misleading um, statement. And based on that, we have responsibility in that regard. But with respect to food items and drug items, that is outside of our jurisdiction. Well, then may I inquire, quality control, especially in the organic food industry, um, who is responsible for that? Which agency? Okay, so, so under the remit of the, of the Food Act and Regulation, it would fall under our remit in terms of being a, a, a drug or food. Now, in terms of of medical claims, there's a definition of what a medical, medical claim is. It deals with either to mitigate, cure, or treat. So if on a particular label there isn't any indication or a claim or an advertisement that this product can, can either cure, mitigate, or prevent, it falls out of the realm of a drug, and it falls into now a food item. Now, based on the requirements and the legislative remit under the Food Act and Regulation. In the case of, of a product purporting to, to reduce or eliminate or, or manage um, some sort of, um, as, as, the, as the minister mentioned, belly fat, then there isn't any conclusive evidence provided that this product can actually do it, do what it is claiming to do. So it would fall under food and drug, and also it would be a bit misleading to the public unless there are additional information that's related to the product that gives further advice in terms of what are the other dietary requirements that needs to take place in conjunction with the use of this, of this particular product. 
Thank you. Um, Member Beaker. Okay. Uh, my question had to do with the statement from uh, Mr. Khan, Director of Chemistry, Food and Drug, regarding uh, efficacy and um, safety. Because many um, things you may take might be very efficient in fixing the issue that you have, but it may have some side effects. A case in point would be Omega XL. Um, Omega XL, from my experience, worked. But then I spoke to someone months after who told me that there's a significant side effect that had to do with fertility. I have to have two children. I would like to have more. So I stopped taking it. The issue is, is are we, are, but I'm, I'm not saying that it's true, but because I don't know, I can't take it. When you, watch the, when you watch television, you see the Americans, when they advertise medication, they give you the laundry list of side effects so you can make up your mind definitely if you really want to take it. Do we have that requirement to provide side effects for, for, for medicine? Yes, again, if I go back to the registration process, it's part of the registration process and requirement that the insert would indicate all of the country introduction and also all of the adverse re action or reaction that could happen if it is you consume this particular product. So there is information regarding that. But you don't see it because, for example, you'll see a half an hour advert on a half an hour segment running and you would not see uh, any special effort to point out any side effects of note. Uh, so I don't know if, if, if there is something that we can do to fix that problem. Sure. Well, uh, d before we go to Dr. Henry, I think, um, as we lawyers say it, you have to read a small print. So, Dr. Henry. Okay, morning, everyone. Um, kind of on the same team, for the benefit of the public, when one has to make a decision between buying brand drugs and so-called generic drugs, is there any confidence that the generic brand is as good as the brand, the, the as they say, um, how how does the public feel assured about these things? Who who is responsible for making us feel confident and under CDAP or under, or if you're buying out of your own pocket, you know, because the price differences can be quite significant. So again, within the ministry level, you also have the Antibiotic and Narcotic Committee. You also have the, the Drug and Variety Committee. And similar registration process, be it for branded product as well as generics, also go through these two, two committees that comprise of experts within the respective field. And again, it will go through the safety data, the clinical data, certification, certificate of analysis, to make a determination and, and advise accordingly in terms of the safety and the efficacy of this particular drug. So based on those two robust systems, and I can say the robust system, it gives the assurance to the consumer that be it the branded or the generic, all right, would give, as, give, give, give the assurance to the consumer that the product is safe and also the efficacy of the, of the drug is also there also. There been sorry. Have there been um, instances, recent instances, or while you've been at the food and drug division, have there been instances that you know of where a particular product was found not to have met the standards that it was supposed to have met, and? If you found such a product, what was the the division's response to that? So, so yes, within 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 the last year, we have a number of cases regarding pharmaceuticals, um, and there was one in particular that was quite um, very prominent in the news and both print as well as the electronic media. The Ministry of Health, through its investigation, through its inspector, were able to pick this product from from a particular location, would have done the due diligence, and then would have sent forward to our legal department to the DPP to determine what legal action can be taken against the importer for bringing this product into the market and then selling the product onto the market and having some serious adverse impact on consumers who would have consumed the product. And also, apart from that, through our international 
collaboration with other entities. Um, we have been able to pick up a number of products and also have national recall that is advertising newspaper. Our inspector will go to the pharmacies to determine whether there's any at the point of sale, seize those items, and then go through into the destruction and further action taken against the particular person or importer. Oh, no, I was going to let, I, I thought Mr. Rahman was going to make, Dr. Rahman was going to make a comment. Yeah. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Just to add to um, the director's comments concerning, you have two sets of products that come to the Drug Advisory Committee. So you will have an innovator product, there's a new product. When that product comes for registration, it's the first time that that product is out. The dossiers and clinical information that is provided for that drug comprises all the level of approvals, whether it be clinical trials, stability studies, you name it. When a generic product is produced, it is a copy of that product. But we bear in mind that manufacturing process, together with excipients or inert ingredients, do affect a drug and the way it is it, it behaves in the body. And for that reason, the generic drug companies must provide what is called a bioequivalence study. So without a bioequivalence, that drug will not be registered by the Drug Advisory Committee. The bioequivalence study will show that compared to the innovator, the uptake, the distribution is exactly the same for their product as the innovator. And it's only then that we will say, okay, we can rely on the safety and efficacy of that. Sometimes we may have recalls for something that has nothing to do with the efficacy of the drug, but because of something simple. So when we have our drug advisory meetings, for example, the drugs are in front of us. Sometime a drug is scored and it has to be taken half. You may try to break that tablet in half and it may crumble. So it's not just active ingredients, but the way it is formulated, the way it is presented. Sometimes we may prevent drugs from being registered because the labeling is appealing to children because of the color scheme or cartoon. So it's not just only on efficacy, but the committee looks at all levels and where this can impact positively or negatively on, on public health. Thanks a lot for that intervention. I could just follow up with Dr. Rahman. Uh, Apotex, does Apotex um, provide information on the efficacy of a drug? Because Apotex deals with generic drugs. Does it provide it for local consumers? So you're asking considering uh, our special subpopulation or does it provide that information in general? In general, they do provide all their data for efficacy, safety. Some generic com companies do their own clinical trials. Generally, if they're, they're copying an innovator, they don't, and they will just do bioequivalence and also send the innovator's clinical studies to show that the parent um, compound does this particular action and behaves in a certain way. So they don't need to repeat a clinical trial, but they need to show that their drug is as good as, even dissolution studies, how fast does the pill take to dissolve in water compared to the innovator, we check those things as well to make sure that it, as in all aspects, not just chemical composition, but in physical properties that the innovator and the generic are equivalent. But Dr. Rahman, could you help me with one bit of clarification then? If it, if it falls into the category of food, looks like a drug, we think it's a drug, the average person might think it's a drug, but it call, falls into the category of food because of the way in which it is devi defined. Um, how is that tested? Or how do we find out um, whether there are standards for that kind of thing? and what those standards are, and are the standards met, for example? Is, is there a means by which that is tested? Okay, so things that do not fall under the remit of 
being a drug, will be a food additive or would be considered a food or a food supplement. Sometimes you would see, if you have looked at the labeling for things coming out of the United States, you will see a clear definition by the FDA at the bottom. The FDA does not you know, either say yea or nay to the claims being made. Because the claims are general claims. To say that something improves metabolic function is general. It doesn't say whether you have to exercise with that, whether that will happen dependent on this particular population or not. And so there's a disclaimer on all these food supplements that take them away from um, that sort of regulatory control. However, if they do provide um, a negative impact, then we will step in. So for example, when energy drinks were now coming out into the market, at the Food Advisory Committee, we had a plethora of food drinks coming out. Many of them contain constituents that are actually in the, the amount that they had, for example, caffeine, were in the level of a drug. And therefore, they were pulled off the market because having 2,500 milligrams of caffeine in an energy drink, you know, even some of the ones that are on the market right now had different types of formulations that were a little um, stronger than the regular drinks. Um, um, those short preparations, and those were pulled off, some of them were pulled off the market because of their, either they had caffeine or they had other stimulants that can be negative or deleterious to someone's health. And so it's, it's an, a narrow line, but we try to see what falls into drugs, what falls into supplements, and even if they are supplement, whether that supplement taken in the way it is meant to be taken is safe. It's important from the consumer awareness point of view that consumers do read the label. Because, for example, let's take a common thing that you will see. Being diabetic friendly, which is something you will see on the market, doesn't mean that you can drink the entire carton, right? If you have a glass uh, and you, you have diabetes, it will not cause severe problems to you. But if you choose to drink four or five glasses, then obviously there's a cumulative effect. And so we cannot safeguard against what people do on their own, but if they, what we try to look at is how the product is intended to be used and whether or not the claims they are making is in fact valid. Mr. Khan, just to get back to you, um, I don't want to hog the microphone. I'm going to allow members to ask their questions. But just one thing, because I forgot to ask you earlier, is, um, remember, I had taken you back to our 2017 visit. Is the lab up? Is it up and running? Right. So I'll ask the deputy director to give some information in terms of the current status of the lab. All right, so good morning again, Chair. At this stage, the lab is not functional. Um, we are at the stage where we are doing t tenders, t tender evaluations. Um, um, one in particular is, um, is an item that the, the fire services had, had requested that we install. It's a gas detector system. Um, so we in the process of do, doing those tenders. Um, once we get that done, then the fire services would do their due diligence and hopefully we get our um, fire, fire safety certificate. Um, we have other tenders for equipment and consumables um, ongoing right now. So once that is completed, we expect that the lab will be reopened in the second quarter of this year. In the interim, who does your testing? Where, where, where is it done? Kariri? Or right, so, it depends. Right, so for me, also, so um, we regarding the gas detector only in 2019, that particular um, issue was raised with the electrical inspectorate. So the new issue that came out that, we, that the Ministry of Health is actually dealing with, we had gone to tenders, and this is second, the first tender we didn't really um, receive the number of bids or the appropriate bids, so it went again for another tendering round to, to determine whether we can get the appropriate um, provider. So with regard to testing, we would normally use the public health lab, Trinidad Public Health Lab, which is under the Ministry of Health. We'd also use other partners, for example, Curry, 
Well, there's a lab at the Mautopa Medical Center, no, sorry, not medical, but the Veterinary Science Center that we use for testing. Kuruwi also is an option that's available to us. And there's also private labs within Trinidad that has some competencies, especially for microbiological analysis that would also access and use those results in making a determination on a particular product that comes beforehand or before us for determination. Thank you very much. Um, the other area I want to ask about is vaping products. I drive around the country and I see stores selling vaping products. My questions are two. What standards are applicable to vaping products on sale in the country, including oils? And two, what advisories are in place for the consumers in relation to vaping and vaping products? Okay, so regarding vaping product and vaping oil, um, as you rightly said, there's an increase in usage of this particular product that we have seen. Based on communication with the tobacco control unit, our our position is that we look at the level of nicotine that's present in, in a particular vaping product. If it contains nicotine, then our position at the Ministry of Health is that it is not allowed. So an importer brings in the, the vaping product, it has to come with a certificate of analysis again to determine what is the level of nicotine in this particular product. Once the nicotine product or nicotine in, in this particular product then it falls into similar to, to cigarette or something resembling cigarette based on the Tobacco Control Act. So based on that, that is the position of the Ministry of Health and the Chemistry Food and Drugs Division to, to, to prohibit and not eliminate, but at the point of entry into the, in, in the, into the country through the border system, we would hold those products and in instances we may also refuse entry of those products into the market. Um, but internationally, we see that some countries have banned vaping because of the clinical adverse impact on that. Um, national, nationally, I don't think there's a policy at this point in time, but definitely at the Food Advisory Committee, um, we could possibly table that as one consideration in terms of developing a national policy regarding the, the vaping and the reported negative side effects in other jurisdictions. Locally, we haven't had any report locally, but I know internationally there have been reports internationally of some of the negative um, side effects using, using the vape and vaping process. I will revert to the Chemistry, Food and Drug Division. Um, in the absence of a lab, where are those, I, I believe 85 workers you have there, where are they housed? And what are the functions or the daily work that the scientific lab assist assistants and chemists do, if in the absence of a lab? What are their roles and functions? All right, so, so in terms of our human resource, re human resource that would have been functioning within the lab, we had a number of employees who were redeployed, reassigned. For example, they were reassigned at the national, the public health lab. Trinidad Public Health Lab, also involved in doing other work regarding the quality infrastructure. Because we are, we are hoping that at one point in time, at some point in time, we can become accredited. So we are developing the quality infrastructure within, the, within, within, within our um, organization that would entail developing of SOPs, developing of procedures in alignment with accreditation and becoming ready for accreditation. Also, we have a number of the lab personnel involved in developing standards and assisting us in developing standards, for example, Codex, Codex Elementary, so which Trinidad Bingo is a member of Codex that develop food standards. So we have a number of those persons that are doing a lot of technical, technical research in advising and also participating at the level of Codex as well as CrossQ that is responsible for developing standards for the region. And that is where they are presently at, and they are housed at the 92 Frederick Street, Port of Spain. These persons who have been redeployed, do they have the skill set to do all that list of things that you say they're going to do? do they, uh, are they trained to do those things? 
Right, so in the case of the redeployment or the reassignment, those would have been scientific assistant. So they would, they would be performing similar function that they would have done at the lab. All right, um, subsequently, they have been recalled back to the division to prepare for the opening of the lab and also to assist with the, with the quality infrastructure that, that we see that is required at this point in time. So through in-house training, in-house training and meeting face-to-face, -face, meeting video conferences, um, they would gain some of the competency that is required to conduct some of the other activities um, that I mentioned regarding CrossQ as well as Codex standards. Um, the other area, I just want to, I just want to say that I'm not asking anything about some of the traditional um, consumer issues in relation to food because we had an inquiry into food fraud that covered a lot of those things and I'm really touching on things that have developed since then. So the, the other question I have is, is in relation to CBD oils being on sale in Trinidad and Tobago, is, is, is there CBD oil available for sale in Trinidad and Tobago and, and what, is it legal and what is happening in relation to say from a consumer point of view? Okay, so I probably can start from the position of the Commission Food and Drugs Division and by extension, the Ministry of Health. Our position at this point in time is that CBD, once it makes a, a medical claim, once based on WHO guidelines is above 0.2%, then it falls within the realm of a drug. And it would require, the, would require to go through the registration process. So our position is that we would normally hold all CBD product that enters or enters for entry into the market, into the local domestic market. We would not allow those to enter. We would hold. In some cases, we may refuse entry also. But it's a fact that we are seeing a number of CBD product on, on the market. Right, and through the inspectorate, of which we have approximately 13, 13 inspectors. What do they do diligence in terms of the market surveillance and the pharmacovigilance to determine whether these products are in the market? And we have pulled, we have pulled products from the market that purports to be CBD or CBD product. And, but I have to acknowledge that there are CBD products and is 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 an issue that we are looking at to see how best to treat with and within, 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 a, within a short time through the, even the Drug Advisory Committee, we'll be developing a policy and guidelines to cover and cater for CBD products and other similar like products that is entering the market. I just want to be clear. Any, if a consumer sees CBD oil or a CBD product on the shelf anywhere, being offered for sale, that is illegal. Is, is that the position? So the position is that it has not been evaluated by Commission of Food and Drugs. So we are unable to, to verify the safety as well as the, the efficacy and the use of the product within the domestic market at this point in time. Right. And also, um, in terms of the, the THC, which is, which is basically the, the more dangerous part of the, of, the, of the cannabis plant or the hemp plant, the THC, if it, if it contains THC, then it falls within the realm of the drug inspector and falls on a narcotic that requires a different regime of assessment also. Could I inquire, um, your scope covers Tobago as well? Yes, yeah, so being a vertical services, yeah, we do, we do cover both Trinidad as well as Tobago. Um, since we're dealing with um, food, let's look at fruits, vegetables, root crops. Do you all take a basket of these goods and test for pesticide level? Or, and if it's done, 
what is the maximum residue level of pesticide that ought to be found in the fruit. Let's take, for example, um, you know, tomato decides of fruit, right? Um, let's take, for example, you have um, pineapple and so. What is the maximum residue level and what is the maximum that was ever found beyond the maximum level? If, if, if I'm making sense there. There is a, a threshold. What is it? the amount that is from beyond the threshold for any of these crops. Okay, so I pass that, that question to Mr. Hasselman Ali, who is the registrar, but just to mention that at the codex level, there are a technical committee known as the Codex Committee on Pesticide Residues. They are the international body that would set res pesticide residues on food and food products. And we'd use the guidelines of those sort of um, information and the standard that is set by this committee of which, as I mentioned, we do participate in some of these committees, and one of these committees is what we participate in. But I'll pass information to the question to Hi, good morning, committee. Um, before I answer the question with regards to pesticide, uh, maximum pesticide levels on crops, and in particular your question on tomato, um, I just wanted to set a baseline. Um, Unfortunately, um, Trinidad and Tobago, um, in order to check for maximum residue limits of pesticides in crops, need to really have a national gap standard develop and a national gap policy in place. It's the baseline by which agricultural production takes place, and gap meaning good agricultural practices. Pesticide use and judicial use of pesticides is dependent on your gap policy and, it's also depend, and it, it also um, creates the, the, the baseline for which farmers would be applying pesticides on their produce. Um, in saying that, under the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Act, um, provisions are there for the development of regulations as it pertains to pesticide residues. However, those regulations were never developed. In the absence of those regulations, what the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board has been doing as part of the registration procedure for pesticides is actually looking at the um, maximum residues um, that can be used and correlating them against the rate of application um, to be used on the crop. Um, that has also been substantiated by the use of the University of the West Indies to assist with efficacy trials and to look at the minimum levels of pesticides that could actually be sprayed on the crop. And the would-be importer would then bring that back to the board for evaluation. So it's really done before the pesticide is, is brought on the market and before it's registered. Um, what we've started doing in Trinidad, I'm part of the National Gap Committee, and we've started developing a national gap policy and a national gap standard. Um, with the hope of that standard being implemented. It's a voluntary standard, um, but with the hope of it being implemented, and of course guided through the auspices of NAMDEFCO as the marketing agency, and therein after have a national monitoring system for pesticide residues. Um, of course, unfortunately, with the laboratory being um, non-functional at this time, it is also a challenge but pesticide residues, and this is where I would answer your question, pesticide residues, it's a very specific to the actual pesticide. And the requirements for the laboratory, it's, it's huge. Um, to sustain a pesticide residue lab, you need to have all the available standards for all the available pesticides that you have on the market, coupled with very sensitive equipment that could check each one of those pesticides and approve test methods. So it's a very robust and rigorous system that's required for doing adequate and just to start pesticide residue analysis system. Uh, yes, um, Director, I just wanted to ask if we have a problem in Trinidad and Tobago of usage of pesticides that were banned in places like the U.S. and so on. Do we have that problem and to what extent do we have that problem? All right, so with regards to banned pesticides, um, pesticides are banned internationally by two major conventions. Um, one, the Rotterdam Convention, which speaks to the prior informed consent of certain hazardous pesticides, 
Annex 3 of that convention has a list of pesticides that countries are asked to either take a national action on, whether ban or propose some restriction with regards to its use. The other convention is the Stockholm Convention. Now, certain countries take certain positions on different pesticides um, for different reasons. Um, probably there are new formulations that are available within the country that will rival the old formulation. Um, the use of the pesticides is no longer required, right? And hence they would ban it. But for, in third world and developing countries, we rely heavily on guidance from the international bodies like the Rotterdam and like the Stockholm. In Trinidad and Tobago, all the pesticides that are listed under the Stockholm Convention and all that are listed under the Rotterdam Convention has been phased out and they are no longer imported into Trinidad. The Pesticide and Toxic Chemicals Control Board has also taken action on a couple of pesticide active ingredients because of poor use, um, one of those being an active ingredient called Coparophos, um, which has been traditionally used for the control of termites. Um, but we found that certain persons were using that particular active ingredient in homes which were causing adverse effects on children and in, in pregnant women. These were studies that were done by the US EPA. So that was one. The other one was an active ingredient used to treat um, telephone poles, um, chromated copper arsenate. Um, it's a carcinogen. And the, one of the, the actions by the pesticide board is not registering any carcinogens in Trinidad, and that was another action that was taken by the board. Sure. Okay. Uh, question for um, Food and Drug, I believe. It has to do with the response on the Ministry of Health on page 8, item J, near the bottom of the page, regarding the facilities inspected regarding meat and processed milk, but it's the meat I want to focus on. Because um, the response speaks uh, to our work choice, meat Nutrimix. Um, but what about the importers? Um, member, I think we should uh, try to not use the names. The names. But because was, there was, may be other companies with similar problems. And no, no, I, by I was calling being, their names. But I was being complimentary. <laughs> so that's the only thing. Well, but you okay. know, I would okay. prefer I, I if we don't. Okay, then. So, so it was not it was not to disparage them. It was uh, I was speaking to the to the ones that were not named, um, but I take the guidance. Basically, I'm speaking to imported meats because I could remember clearly when I went to, to do a, a session in food and drug a time ago when I wanted to get a food badge, and the person not naming the brand, they specifically told each and every participant not to sell a particular brand of meat that was on the market chicken that is, that is on the market that was imported. And I want to know what is done regarding imported meats in terms of inspections. I think it has to do with the age of the meat before it, before it had reached Trinidad and Tobago. OK, so I will answer that question um, later in, the, in my discourse, just to give you a little feedback so you understand, first of all, from the Ministry of Health, we are looking at giving as much pro, uh, protection for our consumers and our local public. If we look at the consumption level of chicken in this country, we are probably the highest per capita consumers of chicken in the world. Currently, we are processing consumers are eating one million head of chicken per week in Trinidad. Of that, only 20% or 200,000 heads are imported. It means that 800,000 is locally produced, and that is where our major effort is. When you see the facilities that we talked about, full-time inspection and audit inspection being provided, that covers half a million of those heads of chicken per week. So because of resource constraints, human resource and otherwise, we try to target the areas that will get greatest bang for the buck. From the import level, we use different methodologies to provide that. So the first is through the import permit process, and that is governed by the Ministry of Agriculture. So the Ministry of Agriculture will issue an import permit to allow particular products to come in. 
And in that import permit, they will state what are the conditionalities for that particular product. So for example, processing date, a, uh, how long past processing would it be allowed? So um, that, that is controlled through the import permit process. Once an import permit is granted and the product is allowed entry into the country, then at the port of entry, that is where the product will go to the chemistry, food and drugs cess station. And once the documentation is in order, certificates of wholesomeness, for example, most of our imported product comes from the US. Probably 95% of the chicken that is coming is coming from the US. Um, and so they will have a USD health certificate to accompany that. So just as we have equivalence with drugs, we look at that. If, however, through organoleptic examination, the public health inspector or the food and drugs inspector is the on site, determines that there's something that looks, smells, you know, um, doesn't appeal to, to our normal senses, then that product will be pulled either for testing or for further evaluation. Dr. Henry. Um, I was going back to the um, explanation given by the director. Um, what about something like Roundup that has been in very controversial uh, between Europe and America in particular? How, have we dealt with that issue, and what what do you say to the public on that? Um, Roundup or, or the active ingredient glyphosate, yes, has been quite controversial at the U.S. in particular. Um, while the United States was taking action or persons were taking action against Monsanto, the manufacturer, um, you had the European Union given a five-year extension on its registration, right? So it, um, in looking at the information, the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board um, looked at the information coming out from EFSA, which is the European Food Safety Agency, and um, evaluations done by the US EPA. Um, to date, we have not had any information coming out from the other bodies of science, and, and that w those bodies would be the International Chemical Review Committee under the Rotterdam Convention, as well as the Stockholm Convention. Um, usually, if there is a serious risk to public health um, by a particular active ingredient, it gets to these conventions, um, you know, of course, by lobby um, from different trading blocks. And then a decision is made which guides the various parties to these conventions, right? Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, the position is that the way Roundup or glyphosate is being used um, is not consistent with the way it's being used in the United States. Um, Roundup in Trinidad or glyphosate cannot be used in crop production. If you were to apply Roundup to your crop, you will kill it. Right? Um, we would use Roundup in Trinidad and Tobago to control weeds in fallow land, basically. Um, in the United States and other jurisdictions, you have um, genetically modified food where they are resistant to glyphosate, and the Roundup or the glyphosate is sprayed over the crop to control the weeds, um, thereby having those residues in that food. Um, even at the point of processing. Um, fortunately for Trinidad and Tobago, we do not have GMOs being grown here, and as such, we do not have the issue of Roundup being used within a crop production cycle. Okay, thanks, thanks for that clarification, but I just want to comment on the issues I have in terms of eating tomatoes or uh, cucumber with the skin on. You know, can I be rest assured that it's okay? I mean. How, how, how safe is that? <laughs> As opposed to peeling the cucumber and <laughs> then eat it. <laughs> so I will just follow up with the um, same pesticide. And I just want to uh, reconfirm what you have said. Because of the, the difficulty in testing um, these food crops, and in the absence of a pesticide labs, uh, lab, no crops, food crops, are tested for residue levels. Is that so? No crops in Trinidad. And if that is so, what happens with the cocoa beans that have to be exported? All right, so testing 
for export is something that takes place. Um, NAMDEFCO, of course, being the national agency, has a system in place where exporters would have those exported crops tested. We also have, um, with regards to cocoa being exported out of Trinidad, um, work was being done through the Cocoa Development Company and Kariri to have testing done on the beans for export. Um, what we are concerned about um, would be the produce that's being sold locally on the market. Hence the reason why we are so adamant in developing our national gap and ensuring that farmers follow a very comprehensive system for production in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the question um, Dr. Dr. Henry asks with regards to peeling of the fruit and the pesticide residues being on the fruit, um, it's a real concern. Um, and it's something that all of us need to be cognizant of in terms of how you consume, consume your, your food. Um, washing is one way to remove some of the residues. Um, using something like an, organo, um, an organic based product on a cucumber will definitely leave residues within the wax layer. So it's a matter of concern, and yes, we would advocate even peeling some of those fruits before you consume them. Could I ask, since you, you spoke about um, the development of the gap, how much, how much more time will you take to have something in, in place? Currently, the, the national standard has been completed. Um, what we are working on, in fact, um, next week we have work being done on the national guidance document. So there are various components of the gap that we have various agencies working on. Um, of course, my agency is working on the development of the use of pesticides and the judici judicious use of pesticides. And we are developing the, that, the guidance document where the, um, you know, it, it's not highly technical. So the average person can actually use the document if they are going into crop production and they want guidance on how to apply pesticides to the crop. And, and, and it's like that for the entire document. It's quite comprehensive. And I think we took the time to go through every part of our crop, the crop production cycles to ensure that the um, farmers would be fully advised in terms of what they need to do when they are growing their crops. Again, with some pesticides, do we engage personnel like from ECA or personnel from Ministry of Agriculture, more particularly the extension officers, because they work directly with farmers? And what about setting up some perhaps some pilot project where these farmers could come and you could do integrated pest management with, with these farmers? Is that so at all? So currently in the Caribbean, there's a uh, a Jeff Globally Environmental Facility FAO project that has been ongoing from since 2016. Um, there are five main components of the project. The first one being um, the export of obsolete pesticides from the region. Um, just for information, the region exported over 300 tons of obsolete pesticides in 2016 and 2017. Trinidad and Tobago exported 87 tons of pesticides from Trinidad and Tobago in 2016, right? Um, a part of that project, one of the components deals with looking at alternatives to highly hazardous pesticides. We have two components of that, that part of the project, one being executed in Trinidad, um, where we are looking at alternatives to fungicides, chemical fungicides, and the other part being executed in Jamaica, where they're looking at alternatives to chemical pest, um, insecticides. And part of that development is actually to have farmer days where the farmers will actually come out and see what are the techniques available under IPM and some good agricultural practices as well as alternatives to pesticides using you know, um, other methods of control um, to control pests on their crops. Right? So that has been ongoing under the FEO project. AICA has been partnering with um, foundations such as the Copper Foundation and farmers under that particular um, project has been trained in GAP um, at the Sugarcane Field Center. We had about between 30 to 50 farmers attend the training session. And it's projects like those that are ongoing, um, apart from what we do um, you know, on our day-to-day -day basis within, the, um, within the, the, the division. Yes, my, um, my next question is probably more appropriate for the Consumer Affairs Division. Um, 
of the Ministry of Trade. In terms of the labeling of products, I notice in some groceries now that you're getting a lot of um, products that have different languages, in fact, and you're struggling to find the English to see what is actually in the product. Have we addressed that issue, or what is, what is going on with that? Because certain form types of pasta and so on, and it's very difficult to figure out uh, what they're saying in terms of products labeled in, in foreign languages. Um, <clears throat> morning again. Uh, the, currently, there are, there are no legislation dealing with um, ensuring that labels have, that they should be written in um, plain English. However, we have recognized that shortcoming and um, in developing our national consumer policy, uh, which was approved by the cabinet in um, 2018, we have proposed new consumer legislation that will deal with that particular issue, that all labels with respect to particular goods sh should be written in plain English language. Currently, the legislation is uh, being uh, <coughs> considered, and uh, we have hired a consultant, and uh, we expect that new consumer legislation should come in, uh, the draft legislation should be presented sometime in the month of October. However, we have also recognized that um, under the Consumer Model Bill, which was approved by the COTED, the Council of Economic Trade and Development, CARICOM, they have addressed that issue. And uh, we are expected as a member state to uh, implement the provisions of that particular legislation. Thank you. Um, I believe bef there is a question from Member Obika, but I believe, uh, Director, you wish to make a clarification on something? In the, the Food and Act and Regulation, there is stipulation for labeling requirements. It also makes provision for if a product is manufactured in a country where the language is not English, that the foreign language can be placed on the label. However, there must be labeling in English on any panel except the bottom of the panel. So it makes provision for, for dual, dual labeling in terms of languages. And just to add, presently at the Food Advisory Committee, we are, re, we are working on a number of labeling regulations amendment to the current act, which is basically about four different regulations dealing with labeling, as well as an entire suite of recall, recall requirements to put into the legislation to make it more firm and robust. A clarification, Member Vika. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> this question is for the Ministry of Trade and Consumer Affairs Division, I, I, I would assume. Um, it has to do with the submission from the Ministry of Trade on page 4 regarding the retail price in the index. But it's really about what is not there. And it draws me back to in 2006 when I was calculating inflation for Tobago. The, the request from the Division of Finance was that we, we compute a... Um, the cost of living for a family of four, um, the cost of medical expenses for a retiree, the cost to keep a uh, for a family to keep a child in primary school, secondary school, university, and the monthly costs of, um, including, of course, the cost of um, rent within that. So it's not just feeding, but also rent and transportation. Um, and I see that you, you conduct uh, retail price surveys. Is it? within your purview or is it within, within the information that is available to you to produce uh, um, a, a, guest, a best guesstimate, I guess, or a best estimate of a cost of living for in, in dollar value for a family of four and these other items that I uh, requested? Good morning. Uh, our, our survey that we conduct Basically, we look at uh, a basket of goods. Right, what we have um, done, we did a survey in uh, 20, 2014, and we came up with a basic basket of goods. And that basket of goods, we, we will uh, survey monthly 48 supermarkets throughout Trinidad and Tobago, and um, we would collect the prices for these goods, and we would um, publish those, those, um, those prices. It's basically done for comparative purposes as the case be, and keeping under uh, review um, the, the ongoing of food prices. 
But uh, with respect to coming up with um, the question that you asked, that is not uh, under the remit of um, the Consumer Affairs Division. It more falls squarely in the, in the remit of um, the central bank and um, the CSO. Could I, Chair, then ask, because I recognize a, a colleague in, in Mr. Mohammed, an economist, yes. is it possible at the level of the ministry to, to provide some guidance where that is concerned? So, for example, if a trade unit wants to understand if their, their, their members are being paid wages that they can subside on, um, it can help them in negotiations. If a policymaker, the Ministry of Social Development, wants to appreciate if a family really needs food, food support, this, this metric could provide them with some assistance if they can see, because it, it's beyond poverty line measures, it really, starvation, um, living measures, so they can understand if support is required or not. So I don't know if, if our economists at the ministry can provide any. Actually, before Mr. Mohammed, if Mr. Mohammed said anything on that matter, I would just want to recognize that uh, the CSO and the Central Bank, we would not want to go against something for which they have a primary remit, so our comments would be comments. So, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. Yes, it is possible, probably not at the level of the Ministry of Trade and Industry because um, of resources and so forth, and because of the, the nature of the study that would be required to be undertaken. You know, CSO normally calculates this information, and I can't see why it wouldn't be possible to do it at the level of a household of four. Because just as you outlined, all those elements that you spoke about rent, transportation, food, and a whole other range of items normally um, that encompasses a household expenditure is considered for the calculation of the retail price index. So at the level of a household of four, I don't think that that is impossible or difficult to do at all at the level of the central statistical office. Just to inquire, I see in the, the paper provided by the ministry of trade and industry, you said that the last household budget survey was conducted in 2008, 2009. Um, would that kind of survey be relevant to what Member Obika asked about? Uh, the survey was conducted basically to look at the determining the basket of goods, so a uh, basic basket of goods uh, that consumers in Trinidad and Tobago would purchase. And um, it will stop at that, that particular point. Yeah, so what, what we will do in, in, in terms of uh, in collecting the goods, right, the, the uh, supermarket goods, right, we would get from the, the consumers in, through our surveys as to what is the the basic goods that they would produce, and we use that to do our prices survey. I think that the, the mechanism of the household budget survey is no longer useful. There's another uh, mechanism that's used. Well, as, as recent as um, 20, 2019, we did a, a next survey, and in, uh, when we conducted that survey, we recognized that uh, the basket of goods, uh, basic basket of food goods, remained the same. So there were no changes uh, recommended in that particular basket of goods. And I have uh, a small question for the Ministry of Trade and Industry, um, because a lot is being made, a lot is being said about the promotion of our fashion industry. And you said in your report, um, under quality in local manufacturing, you said there was a pilot project which was initiated with one garment manufacturer. Could you tell us a little more about that? Chair. Page 20, paragraph 2. Thank you. I think that might be referring to the standards that was developed. Yes. And the TTBS actually worked along with the fashion industry, coordinated by Fashion TT, to develop that standard in terms of the, if I'm not mistaken, the cloth that is used, the type of, uh, of material 
that they would want um, stakeholders to be aware of and the importance of ensuring that the standard is adhered to as that makes the stakeholders more competitive ultimately locally, regionally, and beyond. But I, perhaps, I don't know if TBS wishes to expand on that or... That's but that essentially is uh, the issue, and we are really, as you've mentioned, Madam Chair, seeking to build competitiveness uh, of the entire non-energy sector, including fashion. Okay, uh, another question I have for the Ministry of Trade um, is that um, in terms of our products, our, our export products, have we had problem, encountered problems in terms of sanitary, phytosanitary measures? in terms of getting our products into foreign markets. I, I'm sure there are some technocrats that the Ministry of Trade will understand what I mean. In terms of the value, the quality of the product. Thank you, uh, member. The requirements for entry into foreign markets vary. And in some instances, there have been uh, requirements for certification in other jurisdictions. That is a process that can sometimes be lengthy. If it is an issue that may need some sort of explanation um, or further negotiation, that's a process that also that the business community will undertake sometimes if it is brought to the level of the Ministry of Trade and Industry, there may be a discussion with another government in terms of assisting in overcoming those areas. Perhaps it might be a matter of having more information on the registration process for a particular good, as, it, as the case may be. Uh, this question is directed to TTBS. Uh, what action is taken when inspectors find deficient or rejected goods? What action is taken? That's one. And two, for the last maybe two to three years, um, were there locally manufactured goods that had to be recalled? For any, TDBS has jurisdiction for products that uh, fall under compulsory standards outside of food, um, pharmaceuticals. So in, in detection of any non-conforming product, whether at the port or through our local product certification um, programs or market surveillance, the retailers would be formally advised to remove the product. We would contact whoever the importer or manufacturer is and indicate such, and that those products would have to be removed. And depending on the item, we would treat that such in terms of having it re-exported or, or destroyed under supervision. As it relates to a product recall, for the time I've been at the Bureau, I have not, um, I have not seen any product recalls. However, at the moment, there is a product that's come to our attention um, to do with electrical safety, where the, the agent is conducting a voluntary recall, and we are advising them as to how to go about proceeding with that. Very much. Very, very quickly, I want to thank you for the comprehensive written submissions. They were very helpful to me and I'm sure my colleagues. Mr. Hazmat Ali, you've, you've done exceptionally well for the viewing and listening public in relation to the agriculture products. I thank you for that. You actually helped me too. I, um, Appendix 4 on the Ministry of Health submission deals with the draft food nutrition labeling regulations. And I found it to be very comprehensive. And I really hope that we could see them been uh, approved and become part of the law. There, there's one question I wanted to, these regulations deal with prepackaged products. And 
in particular those that make health and nutrition claims. I wanted to know from all of you what, what is proposed or being considered for food that is sold in restaurants, fast food outlets, and on the roadside. Because prepackaged food products make nutritional claims or health claims or so on. But just as much food is sold via these outlets, restaurants, fast food, and roadside vendors, and so on. And what, what is being considered to cause, for example, on menus that nutritional value and information relating to food and health is disclosed on in, in menus and on menu boards and so on. And in particular, what is being considered in relation to the disclosure of calorie content in, in meals which are sold in these places? I see people every day consuming these products from the coffee shops and so on with just looking at it, just looking at it may cause you to put on about 10 or 15 pounds. Just looking at the product. And I'm, I'm worried that our, our citizens are not aware that some of these international brands and local brands offering these products that look nice, and some of them contain fruit, and some contain veggie, ver vegetables, have the calorie equivalent of a week's a week supply of your recommended daily um, consumption. So I just wanted to know that in relation to those works. Chair, a, a lot of these issues fall under the Public Health Inspectorate. I will ask the members here to provide a response to the extent that they can, and we have taken a note of the questions, and if you will permit, we can provide some of those in writing. Certainly, that, that will be fine. Senator Beaker. Thanks, Chair. I have a final question. Um, whilst it may not have been presented in the, in the responses, the Higher Purchase Act uh, is one of the things that falls under the remit of the Consumer Affairs Division. And there are countless stories of, of citizens be getting menacing calls from agents acting on behalf of, a, of companies that sell items on higher purchase. Uh, when they have varying degrees of debt, um, sometimes they may have paid even more than the, the value of the item and, and so on. Uh, what, what recourse do they have where, when this is concerned? Well, uh, consumers have, have the option to lodge a con to complaint with the Consumer Affairs Division who would um, investigate the complaint with the view of um, providing the, the best redress to the consumer that um, the consumer would have requested. And so they can lodge their complaints via our Facebook page. They can call us on our 800 toll free line. They can send in uh, complaints via emails, or they can go to any of our, our varying offices, short Trinidad and Tobago, and lodge a complaint. And we would represent them before the, uh, the supplier. And, and, and the other thing uh, is does the law prevent persons from seizing items at at certain hours of night and so on, because sometimes they have, a, they have a habit of going at particular times for maximum impact in terms of embarrassment to persons. So what, what does the law state regarding repossessing of the items? Well, with respect to, to repossessing of items, uh, the, the law specifically states that if the, the consumer would have paid more than 70% of the higher purchase price, the supplier cannot repossess the item unless he or she gets a, a court, court order. Let's say higher purchase price, for example, let's say an item mm -hmm. is selling for $1,000. Mm -hmm. um, are you saying up to 700 of the 1000 or no, after well, they've made all the payments, they would have paid $2,000, so if the, they pay $1,400? The, the, higher purchase, the higher purchase price would include the, the cash price and any um, interest charges. Thank you. I think um, that's it for questions. 
So I will invite closing remarks, first from Ms. Morales, and then from Ms. Signore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, members of the committee, chair, chair and members of the committee, um, we wish to thank you for your comments and feedback. Um, there have been a lot of probing questions that has certainly um, generated some thought, and we commit to um, reviewing all of the recommendations and comments with a view to um, improvement in terms of promoting and maintaining regulatory control with respect to the protection of consumers and the implementation of modern practices. Also, uh, we recognize the need to work in close collaboration with our counterparts in the other ministries and agencies, and uh, particularly the Consumer Affairs Division. So um, the discussions have prov provided a great insight to us into the execution of our public health functions. And, uh, we remain committed to working with the counter our counterparts to promote and maintain regulatory control. I would like to thank you again, Chair, and members of the committee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. On behalf of my colleagues at the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and of course, the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards, we want to express our sincere appreciation for this opportunity. It's been very enlightening for us as well, hearing from the colleagues at the Ministry of Health. In our opening remarks, we also need to emphasize the importance of interagency collaboration. And today's discussion also highlights that, as well as the importance of having areas, avenues for redress, areas where consumers can complain and A, be uh, ensured of follow-up. And that also means that we perhaps do need to step up our efforts in terms of consumer awareness and if only to educate all that there are measures in place where one can seek redress and where one can be comforted that elements are in place for the protection of the consumer. We do look forward to moving on the areas that we identified here this morning, and we want to take this opportunity once again to thank you all for this opportunity and for a very enlightening exchange of views. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank all of you for the invaluable information provided and provided in a way which I think is palatable to people looking on and listening. I wish to commend you on um, making that special effort to ensure that members, look, uh, members of the public looking on and listening will understand the sometimes the complicated concepts that you are talking about. I want to thank the committee members, support staff, media, viewing public, and persons in the public gallery for attending and participating. There being no other business, the meeting is now adjourned.